Welcome to this Monday edition of Focal Point on AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. Congenial, convivial, and amiable as uh, always. Latest news on the Boston Muslim Massacre front is that the detained suspect is not going to be classified by this administration as an enemy combatant. They are going to force him to be tried in a civilian uh, court. Now, the senators that were calling for him to be classified as an enemy combatant only wanted that for the purposes of intelligence gathering. They know that by law, he can't be tried in a military tribunal, has to be tried in a civilian court, because we made, we made the absolutely stupid mistake of granting this guy citizenship. He took his oath of citizenship on 9-11, less than six months ago on the anniversary of 9-11. That's when he became a citizen of the United States. Now, he's... A citizen, so he's got all the rights that U.S. citizens have. And whether it was smart of us to give him those rights or not, and it was really, really stupid, he's got them, and we've got to recognize those. But the Supreme Court has said that an American citizen can be classified as an enemy combatant. If he was classified as an enemy combatant, then they would be allowed to interrogate him to gather intelligence before he get lawyered up and go silent as his attorney certainly would insist that he be. So we'll get into uh, all of that and more. Just a programming note. Uh, our program will end about 35 minutes early today so we can take you to a live broadcast from the Heart Cry for Revival Conference at the Billy Graham Training Center at the Cove in Asheville, North Carolina. So that's going to happen uh, today. We'll have Richard Owen Roberts of International Awakening Ministries. He was featured on our DVD series, Behold Your God, so he will be featured today in our live broadcast from the Heart Cry for Revival conference at the Billy Graham Training Center at the Cove, Asheville, North Carolina. Now, uh, that reminds us that we understand, as, as Rand Paul has said, what America needs is spiritual awakening. The problems that we have are not problems that politicians can fix. Now, some of them are political problems, and political problems have political solutions, but we are dealing here with a problem of morality. We're dealing with a problem of character. We're dealing with a problem of values. We're dealing with a problem of heart. We're dealing with a problem of spiritual, uh, spirituality, spiritual conviction. And those have to be matters of the heart. Now, uh, looking at Ezekiel 8 through 11 over the weekend, what's telling about this is that this is a record. It's a four-chapter record of God deliberately but reluctantly withdrawing his glory from the nation of Israel because of the abominations that they embraced in their midst. Now the Spirit takes Ezekiel in the Spirit. He begins in the inner court of the temple, and there he saw the image of jealousy, which provoked God to jealousy, and the glory of the God of Israel was there. So when this vision begins, there's this image, this idolatrous image, this abomination set up in the temple, and the glory of God is in the same place. It's there. The glory of God is still there. But because the people of Israel would not remove that abomination, they would not purify themselves from that uh, idolatry, God said to them, you are going to drive me far from my sanctuary. Now, this is relevant, by the way, when we talk about the Newtown massacre by Adam Lanza, because one of the points that we made is we have spent 50 to 60 years driving God out of our public life, out of our public schools, banned the reading of the Bible in public schools, banned prayer in the public schools, banned prayer at, at graduation ceremonies. And so it should not be a surprise to us that God is not around when we need him. And that's what God was saying to the ancient people of Israel, if you, you can drive me far from my sanctuary. And chapters 8 through 11 is a record of that. So it begins in chapter 8 with these abominations that were being uh, practiced. Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations that they commit here, that they should fill the land with violence and provoke me still further to anger? Therefore, I will act in wrath and though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. So the way in which he carried out his wrath was simply to withdraw his glory from them. He withdrew his presence from them. 
he withdrew his protection from them because they repeatedly told God, we don't want it. We don't need you. We're going to substitute something else for you. So, verse 3 of chapter 9, the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house of the temple. So it goes to the threshold. And then we find in chapter 10, they stood at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord, and that's where the glory of the Lord had gone. The glory of the Lord of the God of Israel was over them at the east gate of the house of the Lord. So they've gone from the inner court to the door to the inner sanctuary, and now they're at the east gate of the temple precinct itself. And finally, in chapter 11, the glory of the Lord departs and stood on the mountain, that's the Mount of Olives, that is on the east side of the city. And Ezekiel explains in chapter 11 why uh, all this has happened. He points, first of all, to political leaders, and he says, these are the men, these political leaders, this, the princes of the people, that means they're the politicians, these are the men who devise iniquity and who give wicked counsel in this city, therefore prophesy against them, prophesy, O son of man. Now what I want you to see there is God says, look, you've got politicians that are devising iniquity and they are giving wicked counsel in your nation, in the seat of political power. Your job as a man of God, your job as a prophetic voice is to prophesy against them, to call them out for the iniquity they are devising and for the wickedness of their counsel. And that still, I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, remains the responsibility of the servants of God, the prophets of God, the preachers in our pulpits. doesn't mean they have to do this all sermon every Sunday, but it's their job to rebuke those that misuse the power and the authority of God. And God later says that I will even hand you over to the sword of foreigners who will execute judgments upon you. That's very striking in light of what just happened in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. I will give you into the hands of foreigners and execute judgments Upon you, therefore, Ezekiel prays, or but God does make a promise that He's going to give them one heart and renew them, and that's the promise. Let's claim together as we join our hearts together in a heart cry for revival. Sovereign Lord, we know that in our day, just as in Ezekiel's time, our cities and our nation have leaders whose plans and advice will result in great harm to our land, and so we pray against all leaders who plot evil and devise iniquity and give wicked counsel in our cities and in our nation. We know that their purposes are not hidden from you since you know the things that come into their spirits and minds. May their counsel and plans come to nothing so that only your purposes may stand. Pray for myself, for my family, the listening audience of Focal Point and AFR Talk, President Obama, every elected official, every man, woman, and child in the United States. And I pray that we will come to know that you and you alone are the Lord. We confess that we are a divided people. We have not walked in your statutes nor obeyed your rules, but have acted according to the rules of the nations who do not acknowledge you. And so we pray that you will give us one heart and put a new spirit in us. Please remove from us our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh so that we will walk in your statutes and keep your rules and obey them. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, George Washington.